heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 281, covering the week of September 27th through October 1st, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page where you can find this podcast along with all of our other lectures, all kinds of great stuff on the YouTube page. We've got our Abbeville U there, which are our little five-minute videos. These things are awesome, and we're going to do more of those. I don't know about the rest of the year, but we do have some other things planned. So make sure that you're on our YouTube page and that you subscribe over there. Also, download our free mobile app. You can get the Abbeville Institute on the go. It's a great way to get the podcasts, also all of our lectures, free of charge. All this is free of charge on the app. And go to Abbeville, uh, the Abbeville Academy. It's abbevilleacademy.org, abbevilleacademy.org. It is how you get our Zoom webinars. If you miss them, we've got them there. You can purchase them there. They're $15, so you can go back and get the webinar. Now, you can't, of course, ask questions, but you do get the chance to go into the webinar and watch it again, which is a great thing, right? So that's that's an awesome website. We've done a lot of these. We just had one this week. Kevin Goodsman was our guest. It was fantastic. We talked about federalism, Jefferson, Madison, Virginia, nullification, the Constitution. We talked about all kinds of great stuff. And so it was a very good lecture and, con- and conversation. Good questions, too. So those Zoom webinars are fantastic, and they're at abbevilleacademy.org. So go out to abbevilleacademy.org. Also, click on the shop tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. Get our logo and all kinds of great stuff. It's high-quality embroidered material. And we do exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like the Institute, you like what we do, you like our podcasts, you like our website, you like our webinars, you like our conferences, you like all of that stuff, please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. It is how we keep the lights on. It's how we keep going. It's how we keep putting out articles. And we have lots of plans for 2022. We're here near the end of the year. It's already October. We know 2021 has been pretty rough. 2020 was pretty rough for the Southern tradition. And we've got to to continue our mission to educate people in the South about these things. So anyways, please consider that donation. All right, well, let's talk about the material for the week. We had a lot of good stuff. And we started the week with this view of Lincoln as the great emancipator, the great patron of freedom. We, if, you, if you follow the Institute for any length of time, you know that we're highly critical of the Lincoln myth, of the righteous cause myth. And the first two pieces of the week really blow that apart. This is, of course, important for American identity and American culture, whatever that means. But the Lincoln myth has allowed for the central government to grow exponentially. It's allowed for the North to have this cover of righteousness, which is incorrect, because Lincoln was the great emancipator. Even look at this new monument in Richmond, the Emancipation Monument, where it's got the Emancipation Proclamation date on the document that the woman is holding. Well, no slaves are freed at that point. Not one. But yet, it's seen as the day that slavery ended in America. No, it's not. That's the 13th Amendment, and it, of course, ignores the fact that Lincoln favored the original 13th Amendment, which would have kept slavery permanent in the Deep South, in the southern states, in the 15 states that already existed. It would have been permanent there. Permanent. They could not have expanded it. They could not have stretched it. And, of course, southerners said, well, that, we already know this is the case. We could keep slavery here for as long as we want. The issue is the western territories. We believe that the Supreme Court has said that we can take our slaves into the Western territories, and that's, that's legal. That's the issue. It's not about slavery here. We're not worried about that. We're not worried about it here at all. We're worried about the prospect for expansion of slavery, which why would Southerners want to expand the institution in the West? Well, it was several reasons. I mean, Jefferson looked at this originally as kind of like a safety valve and a way to eventually exterminate the institution. And Jefferson Davis had kind of the same views. And ultimately, though, it was to keep a balance of power in the U.S. government, the agrarian section against the rapidly industrial section, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians. And this is the way that people looked at this. 
It wasn't about the moral institution of slavery. In fact, even Calhoun said it in 1837. He said, I'm not defending slavery in the abstract. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm defending slavery as it exists right now in America. Not in the abstract. He's saying if slavery is evil, then we need to get rid of it right now, but nobody's willing to do that. So they're not saying slavery is evil. What they're saying is they just don't, they just don't want it here in the United States. But he's saying in the United States, the way that we've done it, it's good. Now, we can disagree with that, certainly. But this is what Calhoun was doing. To say that Calhoun was simply saying that slavery is good in an abstract situation, he's not. He never said that. In fact, he said, we need to give it 10 years to see what's going to happen with it. And maybe it's not a good, maybe it doesn't do good. Maybe we need to get rid of it. But let's see what it does in 10 years, and then in 20 years, or 5 years. What if, let's, let's evaluate after it's given it time to see how this is going to work in this current social, political, and economic climate that in America, in the particular situation they're in. Very few Americans defended slavery in the abstract. Some did, even in the South. They defended it in the abstract. Some did in the North. They defended it in the abstract. But this righteous cause myth is cover for all the horrible things that the North did. It doesn't matter. These people deserved it. These people deserved it is the idea that you get out of this modern conception of what's going on today in America. And you've got this first piece. It's written by uh, Barton Cocky, Shrines at the Hearth Half Builded. And he says, My wife Elizabeth comes from a village called Greenwich in northern New York State. Among the keepsakes preserved by her family is a box of letters from her great-great-uncle, Reuben Stewart, a young draftee who served in the 123rd New York Regiment as it marched to the south, leaving a trail of desolation, suffering, and death. One of those letters, undated, reads as follows, quote, in close, please find some scraps of letters and some Confederate postage stamps that I picked up behind the breastworks of the Rebs near Williamsport. Also the note for a sermon that I got in a church in a place called Greenwich that we came through the other day. And also a song, Hardtack, and yours are. The 123rd came to be known as Sherman's Cleanup Crew. They stole everything of value and destroyed what they couldn't carry away. As the letter attests, they did not mind ransacking churches, even in a place with the same name as their own hometown. One of the enclosed scraps bears a poem apparently composed by one of the Rebs. The title of the poem is Where Home Is. And I want to start this because at the end of this podcast, we're going to wrap up with a beautiful selection that's going to bring this all around together. Where Home Is. Home's not merely four square walls though with pictures hung and gilded. Home is where affection calls, filled with shrines that hearth, that heart hath builded. Home. Go watch the faithful dove sailing neath the heaven above us. Home is where there's one to love. Home is where there's ones to love us. This is what he picked up. This is what, I mean, Southerners are writing a poem of home. This is what they're defending in Georgia in 1865. Home. Here are these guys. They know the war is lost, but they are, they're thinking of home. They want to go home. And they're defending home. Home is where there's ones, one to love us. Home is where there's one to love Home is where there's one to love us. It's beautiful. So this little poem, which was originally written by Charles Swain, I mean, the, the, the young man who uh, penned this, didn't, it's not his work. Uh, but he's, he's thinking of home. But of course, as Cocky says, this guy probably never saw his loved ones again. Maybe. These are his last thoughts, perhaps. And then he talks about tearing down these monuments. And, of course, there's one in Talbot County, Maryland, which was torn down. Uh, and, I mean, this is where we are in 2021. This is who's being taken down. That 
it's it's a young man with a flag, and it honors the Talbot County men who went and fought for the Confederacy. It was put up in 1916. I did receive, though, after this was after we published this, somebody emailed us from Michigan, and there was a monument there that had a, mo- a memorial park, which had a number of monuments to all kinds of wars. But there's a monument that has two soldiers. One is a Union soldier facing north. One is a Confederate soldier facing south. And the city council in this little town kept that monument where it is, even though the university in the area wanted it torn down. That's got to be torn down. And the city council said, no, shut up. And they put a camera up to make sure that nobody goes out and vandalizes this thing. Beautiful. I mean, these people in Michigan, I'm, I'm liking these people in Michigan right there. So beautiful. They said, no, shut up to the idiot professors and students at this university. Hey, you know what we say to that? No, shut up. And they went on, and they put up a camera, and so they're defending that monument. That's great. I wish more people would do this. In the South, we've just, I mean, we don't even have that kind of courage. Southerners don't have this kind of courage for their own monuments to tell these radical idiots, no, shut up. But that home, uh, Shrines with a Hearth Hath Builded, works very well with the last piece of the week. But this is part of the total war. And see, what we're going through right now, Valerie Protopapis wrote a piece about the total war of Lincoln. We are seeing the end of that. And she wraps up the piece. I think this is what we have to say about this. She gives you a summary of what's happened in America. I mean, 1779, 1789, 1861. And she concludes with 2021. She says, Today there is an ongoing, powerful, and ubiquitous effort to finally, once and for all, consign to oblivion the ideas and ideals that drove the people of the South to secede from a union they considered antithetical to the well-being of their people. Ideas and ideals which they continue to boldly declare through the use of Confederate symbols, monuments, and memorials. The fact that their cause is all but lost can be seen in the ongoing successful war against the same monuments and symbols. Supporters of this crusade against the South, for this remains a religious war, declare that the killing of hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as a million Americans, and the destruction of a people in the so-called Civil War was justified to end slavery, a claim that is demonstrably false. But even those who care nothing about the war, its origins or its meaning, revere Lincoln as a hero and a savior of the nation. He was, we are endlessly told, America's greatest president. Indeed, Lincoln's monument is a temple fit for worship rather than a mere memorial. But those who justify Lincoln and what was done in the war for secession with the plea of it was necessary, for whatever reason, justify every tyrant in history who has raped, pillaged, enslaved, and slaughtered his way into power, as well as everyone who will rise in the future. This is true. See, what's happened is the left has embraced totalitarianism. They want everything gone, and with their... Girondin, with their co-conspirators on the right, people like Alan Gelzo, who's certainly on board with this. You see, he is the useful idiot for the left. Alan Gelzo and the Claremont people, the Straussians. Now, I know Michael Anton, well, we, we support Lee. I mean, we wrote, a, we had a published a, a, a nice thing on Lee, but you've got a lot of Straussians who for years have run around saying Confederate monuments should come down. Why? Because they thought this is the way that we're going to be, we're going to rid this problem. We can get back to talking about real things. The culture war will end if we just do this. We just give the left this, it's going to end. Of course, anyone with half a brain, which the Straussians don't typically have, would have understood it was never going to stop there. And the, a couple of pieces this week point that out. It's never going to stop there. This piece does, and the piece on Wednesday by Boyd Cathy points this out. It was never going to stop with that. So you've got the useful idiots on the right aligning with the left, who are the real idiots, and you've got a problem because this is the completion of Reconstruction. When, when Eric Foner talked about an unfinished revolution, this is the finishing of it. What they want to do is finish off anything that would be objectionable to the American regime. They want to finish it off. It has to be finished. She says, embracing the motive for tyranny neither changes its moral dynamics nor its consequences. If we permit the final extermination of Southern heritage, 
in the memory of those boys in gray who fought and died for their homes and their God-given liberties, we consign not just the South, but America, that great experiment, to oblivion. So think about this piece on Monday. Their homes, who died for their homes. This is this young man here in Georgia penning this little poem, writing down what he, what he remembered from Charles Swain. And he's, he's thinking about home. He's thinking about home. Interesting. The other thing is, I thought these Southerners were all just a bunch of dopes. They were stupid. They didn't know anything. Illiterate dummies. But of course, here's a well-read Southerner memorizing a poem by Charles Swain. And scribbling it down. Amazing. So that is what we have to understand. And again, the dopes and the useful idiots, the real idiots, it's it's clear what they want is a complete extermination of traditional America. They want it gone. They want American history to start basically at the end of the civil rights movement. Excuse me, civil rights movement. That's what they want. And you've got the piece on Wednesday by Boyd Cathy. The National Archives labels the Constitution racist. See, this is the thing. The Constitution now is racist. Now, this has been going on for a while. You've had, we, there's been evidence, right? Some people standing out, well, we need to get rid of the Constitution because it's racist. The Declaration is racist. Look at what it says. This is the 1619 Project position. These things are racist. This, I mean, this is what they're saying. These people are all racist. If they're racist, they're evil, and we don't want to have them around. We should not celebrate these people. We should not even talk about these people. American history needs to start in 1975. That's where it really begins. Even Lincoln's racist. I mean, now, I agree with some some of the things they're right in the 1619 Project. If the Declaration really was committed to these this proposition nation, then it never achieved that, and so it's really racist. I mean... We know the founders were racist in the modern conception. And so what they're saying is, okay, well, if that's the case, then we just need to get rid of this stuff. Or we need to have a trigger warning. See, this is actually a trigger warning. You might read this document. It might trigger you. It might say some things in here that uh, are um, not very nice. So Boyd says, uh, you may have thought that the 1619 Project, just an outrageous outlier, a radical and intentionally, I'm sorry, an intellectually dishonest attempt to redo and refashion American history to fit an extreme progressivist, woke interpretation of the past. But that project, lauded and praised by the loudest voices in academia and heralded by the media, already possesses and dominates by and large our educational system, our entertainment industry, and yes, our political discourse. It was inevitable that it would reach the National Archives and its precious holdings. The reimagining of the nation's foundational documents, then, is entirely logical. It is consistent with 1619 and reflects the powerful influence such thinking has and exerts over our governing and corporate classes. But what is truly scandalous and appalling about what is occurring in that opposi- is that opposition to this outrage has been largely muted, with very little news of it in the media. I mean... This is true. You would think that if somebody came out and said, you know, the National Archives, which is part of the federal government, has said the, the Constitution needs a trigger warning. You would think that people would be shouting them out times. This is stupid. What are you doing? No, shut up. But no. Well, we need to think about that. Maybe. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe we do need to have a trigger warning for this. Maybe. But nobody does it. Nobody in, the, nobody in the political class, nobody in the media. So he says, over the last few years, I have written that the efforts to take down Confederate monuments, most egregiously perhaps the recent disgraceful removal of the Lee Monument in Richmond, were just a first step in a major process of fanatical hatred for and redefinition of American history. It is not only the physical monuments themselves, but what they symbolize that has to be destroyed and extinguished. And the hysterical campaign to erase those monuments honoring the Confederate dead is just the first part of this effort. Now, 
I wrote a piece years ago, years ago, and um, about this, and it was about the Maryland State song, which is now gone. But there was a little twit that published a piece in Time Magazine on this, and I responded to it, and he wrote back, uh, and we had a back and forth a couple of times over it. But I pointed out at that time, this was the whole point of it. He made the point that the song was dissident. You see, the song is dissident. It is striking at the heart of the United States empire. And that's exactly why they want to take it down. Dissidents. He says, there was a recent documentary how the monuments came down produced by the Virginia Film Office and widely distributed by PBS, which makes this goal crystal clear. Removal of the monuments is only the easiest hanging fruit, as it were. There is much more to come until, as one of the commentators declares, we have rooted out entirely white supremacy and systemic racism. What does that even mean anymore? That's, I mean, that could be to them anything. We got to root it out. We got to get rid of it. But what does that even mean? It, they define it all. They define it. It's kind of like um, we're going to uh, regulate commerce. What does that even mean? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna think that a rate is just and reasonable. Who decides what's just and reasonable? These terms, these ambiguous terms, are highly dangerous. And their campaign to erase anything that offends them, the woke lunatics have corrupted. I'm sorry, counted upon the benevolence of the establishment Republican Party and very prominent members of what is laughably termed the conservative movement. Either by studied in action or active encouragement, the rich Lowry types, in the near unanimity of the apparatchik pundits on Fox News, have cheered on the destruction of Confederate monuments, while simultaneously praising Martin Luther King Jr. as a true conservative, despite his embrace of Marxism as in a genuinely communist praxis on various occasions. Their response to the madness gripping the nation is to apologize to the left and whine with a form of virtue signaling. Look at me. I condemn those Confederate symbols just like you. Please don't call me a racist. Oh, will you still invite me to one of your swank cocktail parties on New York's Upper East Side? Please. This is the issue. We have no... I mean, there's people in Michigan. I mean, I applaud them. And we've had some small little victories here and there. In Tennessee, a monument stayed up because people actually went and printed off some articles from the Abbey Bell Institute and gave it to the council members. And they said, oh, yeah, no, we're going to keep this thing up. We don't want to do this. We don't want to be in line with these people. You see, the people on the right should say, you know what? If those people want them taken down, well, then we should keep them up just, to, just for spite. We don't like these people. And those people are stupid, so let's not be stupid. But that's not what we're doing, if you're on the right. We also had a great piece. It was actually originally published at Law and Liberty, um, which is the Liberty Funds website. And they published good book reviews there. And Aaron Coleman, who was one of our guests on our webinar, wrote a little review of a book, Irreconcilable Founders, Spencer Rowan, John Marshall, and the Nature of America's Constitutional Republic. It's a great review. We published about the first uh, four paragraphs of it, and then you can go read the rest of it at Law and Liberty. But Spencer Rowan is a forgotten founder. He's um, not just that. He's a forgotten name in American jurisprudence. Spencer Rowan should have been, should have been Supreme Court Chief Justice. But uh, John Adams, understanding what Jefferson was going to do, blocked it by putting John Marshall on the bench and America's forever changed. If Spencer, it's one of those great things that, you know, what if Spencer Rowan had been the, uh, had been the Supreme Court Chief Justice? We wouldn't have had McCulloch v. Maryland. We wouldn't have had several of these. I mean, you can go down the list of the cases that Marshall had. Marbury v. Madison might have been different. I don't know. We know that Rome probably would have agreed with Baron v. Baltimore, but um, that's the only one, because that's where uh, Marshall said the Bill of Rights don't apply to the states. Uh, so, I mean, Gibbons v. Ogden, I mean, there's so many things. Cohen's v. Virginia, I mean, all of this stuff might have been different. Marshall's not on the bench, we have a different America today in terms of power. We might have actually seen a real decentralized federal republic. 
but and I think that Coleman gets into that. I mean, this is this is why this book. It's by uh, David Johnson. You should get it, right? You should get that book. Um, so we do like to highlight books that are that you should pick up, and this is one of them that you should pick up. And then we wrap up the week, and uh, I want to wrap up this podcast with this piece by Paul Yarborough, Once Upon a Time. And he went back into the archives of Southern Partisan. We've done that on the, on the Abbeville website, too. We haven't done it in a while because, um, well, <laughs> the archive access that I have is is uh, packed away for right now. So, uh, But that'll probably come back in 2022. But we, we've got... Um, he went back and he found this article in Southern Partisan, Partisan by Troy Cawley. Article's entitled Hindsight. And he wrote... He, he, he copied and, and pasted into, the, into his article a couple of paragraphs from Cawley's piece. And Yarbrough says, it is titled Hindsight and was first printed in the Southern Partisan 30 years ago. If one can appreciate anything beyond modernity as to life's heart, such as family, tradition, manners, love, friendship, and at the same time cease worshiping gold, silver, technology, industrial revolutions, and the Federal Reserve, this ex- excerpt is, while not an elixir, a wonderful description and a light uh, salve for life as perhaps God meant it to be lived as on this earth, flawed and sinful man. This concept of forced conservatives who truly conserve and understand characteristics such as Jeffersonian's heartbeat of localism and self-government. Conservatism is not Ayn Rand and or foreign wars. God made his chosen people into 12 tribes on a single national one. When most people, I hope, look into their past and the locus and focus are on the home, the family, and to those kind memories that God has planted in us. And so this is what Mr. Cawley said. Technological progress in the past century has been outstanding in the field of transportation. Let's illustrate it. When I was a small boy in central Texas in the 1930s, we lived about nine miles from the county seat, a town of three or 4,000 people. In the fall, we took a bale of cotton to town in a wagon. With a load of this sort, the team of horses walked about four miles an hour along the dirt road, thus taking a little over two hours for the trip. A short time ago, in the 1980s, I flew from Texas to California in a 747 jet about the same length of time. That looks like incredible progress. Let's examine it, though, more closely. On the flight to California, I saw virtually nothing of the country. From an elevation of 36,000 feet, all we saw were some weather-beaten clouds. Our seats were narrow and jammed together, but I visited no one. Nobody showed any interest in me. I was in a crowd, but it was a very lonely crowd. On the trip to town with a bale of cotton... We visited with fellow travelers along the way. We exchanged hearty greetings with neighbors as they sat on their porches. My brother and I had the whole back end of the wagon in which to roll, tumble, and wrestle. We saw field larks in the pasture and heard their cheerful calls. Bobwhite quail thundered out of the bushes along the fence rows. Jackrabbits raced off for the cover of the post oaks. The trip was a big success even before we got to town. In a sense, of course, all of this is trivial. But in a broader sense, it is highly illustrative of a basic fact. Human nature is better adapted in a simple technology than in a highly complex one. People cannot live happily in a society of bread and circuses, especially in the bread has little known nutritional value, and the circuses consist mainly of endless hours of television depicting violence, vulgarity, and unclassified stupidity. The movies aren't much, if any, better. A large part of the use of alcohol and other drugs can be traced to a basic cause, boredom. Boredom bread of Routine factory jobs, impersonal personal services jobs, watching spectator sports instead of participating in true play, dating with uninterested and generally inadequate partners, driving to and from a tested job through ever-growing traffic jams. You can expand the list for yourself. That's a beautiful summary, and I think it really wraps up, and it works nicely with shrines that the hearth hath builted. Home's not merely four square walls, though with pictures hung and gilded. Home is where affection calls, filled with shrines that hearth hath build, heart hath builded. Home, go watch the faithful dove sailing neath the heaven above us. Home is where there's one to love. Home is where there's one to love us. And I think those two things work so well together. Until next time, good day. Good day.